morning and welcome to this hour of worship at Hendricks Avenue Baptist Church. Every time that worship begins for us as a community, I'm, I'm thinking through what this hour might be for us. I don't know about you, but my spirit has felt very heavy in these days. Worship, on the other hand, has an opportunity to be something for us that we desperately need, an opportunity for us to, to lift our hearts, to put them in God's hands and watch what he might do, watch what God might do. There's some words that um, some communities of faith that I have been a part of have said, a call and response, where the person in front of you says, lift up your hearts, and everybody responds, we lift them up to the Lord. Just a moment, I'm going to say those words, and I want you to repeat, we lift them up to the Lord. But before I say that, I hope you'll think about the opportunity that we have to be in the presence of God and what that means for us in these moments together. This isn't like a sitcom that's going to end after 22 and a half minutes where we get some false artificial high. What happens in this moment has real meaning for our lives, can transform us, and through us, it can transform the world. I hope you're coming into worship this morning with that sense of expectation. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's worship together. Every generous act of giving is a tribute to God's love for us. Jesus has taught us to be a grace-filled people. The Spirit works in our hearts to hear and respond to the needs of this world. May we worship this morning, hearing God's words of love, mercy, and life-giving hope. Let us pray. O oh God of all, we rest in the knowledge that wherever we are, there you will be also. As you promised, you are with us always, for yours is a loyalty that surpasses the greatest love we have ever known. Greater love has no one than this, 
you have laid down your love for the life of the world. Let this loyalty of yours, so unknown and strange, arouse us in us a commitment to envision more, to do more, to be more. And not more only, but more for you and our neighbor. Give us the courage to surrender to you our weakness, that you might make it our strength. Grant us the humility to yield to you our power, that you might fill it with love and grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. reading from the Psalms. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. This is the word of the Lord.
A reading from 2 Corinthians. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But then he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the gospel of the Lord. And thank you, Teresa, for singing for us this morning. I'm new to the Hendricks Avenue community, so as I understand it, you are a, a choral director at a local middle school as a daughter who has, I mean, as a father who has a daughter in middle school chorus. Um, that tells me everything I need to know about what a wonderful person that you are. When we all get to heaven, the people at the front of the line, saints, nuns, and middle school teachers, I think. That's how it works. So we give thanks to God for your good gifts this morning. So what's the, um, what's the best housewarming present that anyone has ever given you? Stop and think about that for a moment. Our realtor gave us a whimsical door decoration that says the cook's on it. The day we bought our house in Dallas, not bad. My father-in-law once gave us a combination gas grill and smoker, even better. What about you? Has anybody ever given you a spider? What if I told you that part of the Cook family history is that our family used to give people spiders when they moved in next door? True story. My people are from Oklahoma. My great-grandfather actually signed the charter when Oklahoma became a state. And do you know the stories of the Dust Bowl era days? My family lived them. My grandfather was one of eight children. He lost his dad when he was five years old, and my great-grandmother raised those children on her own. Most people in Oklahoma lived in houses with dirt floors in those days. Some were even built into the side of a hill to help keep the dust out. And the gift that people used to give someone that moved in next door to them was a spider. You see, a spider would eat the bugs that could easily get into a dirt house. A spider wasn't something to be afraid of. It was considered lucky, and it was the kind of thing one poor family could give to another. My dad tells about that story in a volume he created for our extended Cook family. It's the story of my grandfather's generation of cooks and the life they had growing up in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl era. My family's story is probably like many of yours in this room. If you're one of the few people listening to me this morning who remembers the days of the Great Depression, then you know what I'm talking about. How hard moments become the forge that produce good lives. For those of you who lived through World War II, you also know what I'm talking about. For the past few weeks, we've been in this series called Lost and Found. We're losing some things in this hard season in which we find ourselves. But where God is involved, losing can also lead to finding. Two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that that letting go of certainty can actually help us to find a deeper faith. Last week, we talked about the fact that letting go of comfort can help lead to spiritual growth. And today, we're focusing on the fact that letting go of power and learning to live in our weakness can actually help us find deep wisdom. 
That's the lesson you've heard, read about here in this room this morning. I think, without even realizing it, we sometimes romanticize the days of the Bible. We think of the Bible as a kind of magical time when, in reality, if we could pick ourselves up and if we could move ourselves back through time to the days of the Bible, what we discover is not some movie-like experience where everything is dynamic and fast-paced and super spiritual, but instead it's just mainly down to earth as well as occasionally gritty and difficult. Read Paul's letters to the early church and you'll discover how true that is. Take Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. Paul's letters to the Corinthians indicated that the church there struggled with issues like lawsuits among the members, sexual concerns, problems in worship, theological disputes about resurrection, financial matters, gender roles, and the issues of the relationship between Jews, Gentiles, the Old Covenant, and the New. The first few years of the Corinthian church's existence wasn't some kind of kumbaya moment where everyone sat around talking about how much they all loved Jesus all the time. It was hard work to be the body of Christ. But not only was life hard for the Corinthian church, it was also hard for the church's founder. In the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about a thorn in his flesh. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I asked God, take it away. But God responded, my grace is enough because my power is made perfect in weakness. If we made a list of the Christian spiritual elite, Paul would certainly have to be on it, wouldn't he? And yet, what we think we know about the second century source is a really interesting description. A man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs, with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat hooked. Not exactly impressive sounding, is he? And then there is Paul's famous thorn. Throughout the centuries, commentators have made a variety of suggestions about what it was. Some say the thorn was adversaries that insulted and persecuted him. Others have suggested that it was a physical problem, a speech impediment, or a physical handicap. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval theologian, suggested that it was sexual temptation. The truth is we don't know. All we know is that it was a big deal, a big deal in Paul's life. So much so that he begged God not once, not twice, but three different times to take it away. And yet, because of that thorn, Paul penned some of his most potent and memorable language in all of his letters. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. One of the biggest challenges for those of us living at this time and this place in history is that we are scared to death of hardship. We have been so wealthy and so powerful and so comfortable for so long that we can't seem to tolerate a thorn in our flesh. And I, I suppose that's understandable. One of my favorite preachers says that our mind-boggling technology and national wealth have allowed us to relieve so much suffering that we have begun to believe that it should not exist at all. Where it persists... We work hard for a while, we employ experts, we allocate resources, we bring all our own best values to bear, and then we are shocked when they are not embraced. And then, to tell the truth, many of us withdraw walling ourselves off from those who cannot be fixed and often suggesting that it's their own fault. 
We do that because doing so helps us feel safe. If we live in the right neighborhoods and we send our kids to the right schools, if we eat the right foods, if we don't do anything stupid, then hardship like a tornado should skip right over us. Now, don't get me wrong. The urge to relieve people's misery and suffering is a God-given wish. And much good has come from it. But when the desire to relieve others' suffering suddenly changes into a personal fear of any hardship whatsoever, then we will discover that our feet are no longer on the Godward path because ultimately that path leads to the cross. And let's be honest, that's a hard thought. Does it make us bad people? Does it make us terrible Christians to say that? That is a hard thought. We'd much prefer that the abundant life that God is promising is the same thing as the abundant life that the world is offering. But it's not. When Jesus talks about abundant life, he's not talking about the nice house, the fancy car, the fabulous vacation. He's not talking about the life that you have when you have everything you want. For God's power is made perfect not in personal wealth, but in personal hardship. Because hardship helps us understand in a way that comfort and privilege and wealth never can, what it takes to live a blessed life. Just about eight years ago, I accepted the call to serve as the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Wilmington, North Carolina. It is a wonderful church filled with wonderful people. It has an amazing legacy of making a difference in its community. I was privileged to work with fantastic colleagues. I was privileged to pastor wonderful people. I would also tell you that there were a few years in Wilmington that were by far the hardest of my professional life. I don't need to go into all the details. The, sh the short version of it is that we were asking some questions about how to do some things differently as a congregation and change almost always engenders conflict. And in the midst of that conflict, it got tense and divisive for a time. And it was hard. This is hard for me professionally as anything I've ever dealt with. And I would wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it, and I was stressed, and I was not handling it well with my family. It was a difficult, difficult season, and I resented the heck out of the fact that I was living in the middle of it. I was trying to do my best to help that congregation be what I felt like God was calling it to be. But the cost that it required of me in that moment was great. And it was exhausting. And I was tired. And I wanted that difficulty to end. Now, I'm the assistant director of the Center for Healthy Churches. Now, I work with churches who go through moments like that. Now, looking back, I realize that God was preparing me far better than I ever could have been prepared to help churches in the way that he's called me to do now by what I was going through then. didn't make it any less hard, didn't mean that everything that happened should have happened, but God used it. God is using it. And as hard as it was, I am better off as a result. And now on this side of hardship, I know that the hard-won lessons I learned in those moments were exactly the lessons that I needed to do what God is calling me to do now. I think... And I hope that the thorn that was in my flesh has brought me greater wisdom. Having said that, I do want to be careful in this moment. 
not to be insensitive to those of you who are presently suffering. And remember, Paul asked God to take his thorn away, just as Jesus asked his father to keep him from the cross. Ultimately, though, both of those men trusted God. And I think that we have to as well. As hard as what we're going through right now most assuredly is. And if we will trust in him, and the promise that God makes is not that then life will magically become easy, but instead that we will learn to see rightly. We will see the difference between what truly matters and what is temporary and shallow. We will learn that all things considered, it is not hardship itself, but our fear of it that is dangerous to our well-being. Because if Paul is right, then avoiding hardship is the one thing that we can do that is most likely to cut us off from experiencing the power of God and growing in the wisdom that he wants to impart on us. The volume that my dad wrote about our family is called The Best Hard Time. In the conclusion of the book, he wrote these words. Our family stayed in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl era because they were too poor to move. As I write these words, I find myself profoundly grateful that they stayed. I'm absolutely convinced that If they had moved to California or anywhere else, our story would be very different and in more ways than just location. As it was, they stayed, they survived, and they prospered in ways that it is most important to prosper. They made the very best of hard times. May God help us do the same. Amen. We invite you to take your order of worship and sing at home with us today, Jesus Loves Me.
We're so glad that you joined us this morning for this time of worship. We are looking forward to the moment in the hopefully not terribly distant future when we're all doing this together. I wanted you to know that your staff is hard at work answering those complex questions. We have two very, very important things that we're trying to hold in consideration. One, we absolutely know that, that being together that breaking bread together, that sharing life together is part of what it means to be church, and we can't wait for that moment to come. At the same time, part of loving our neighbors as ourselves is making certain that we're taking everybody's safety and well-being into concern. In an organization as large and as complex as ours, there's a lot of factors that go into our ability to pull that off. So we covet your prayers as we ask those questions and come up with those answers little by little, stage by stage, I'm not, as I share with you this morning, at a position to tell you exactly when that's going to be, but I can tell you we're working hard to get ready when that moment comes. I would ask that as you think about that moment and you pray about that moment, as excited as you are when it arrives, to begin to prepare yourself spiritually and emotionally for the fact that for a while yet, even when we're back together, things are not going to be exactly like they were before. We're going to be living with the pandemic and what it means for us probably for months to come. So figuring out what we can do together physically, in the midst of that means that there is going to be a new new normal. The current normal is we worship in this way using technology. The new normal will be different than the old normal that we were back in in February. So we would just ask that you begin to kind of prepare your heart and your mind for that and pray for one another that we all extend tremendous grace to one another and that we seek God's will together as a church as we try to figure out how to be the people that God has called us to be and make a difference in the community that, in which God has called us to make a difference. If you're not part of the Hendricks Avenue Baptist community, Hopefully, you're experiencing things that are blessing your heart. And if you want to figure out how to be more connected, we'd love to talk to you about that. Please reach out to us. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, none of us like the idea of weakness. It's hard to think about admitting it, embracing it. And yet, if you ever set an example for us, it's that you became flesh and dwelt among us. Set the glory of heaven aside and walked a mile in our shoes, even unto death on the cross. And that's a pretty good life, God. Not always an easy one, but a life lived to the full to help us to recognize that what's happening to us and around us in this moment, God, is something that you can use for our benefit to grow us in wisdom, to help us see the world as you see the world and love our neighbors as you love us. We need your help to do that. And so we ask for these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.